How's that? <laughs> uh, I appreciate an animated sound man. I really do. He is animated. He t- yeah, listen, he, uh, he takes his job seriously, and I appreciate that. I think that's good. All right, Romans chapter 12. We're going to take a look at two verses, one verse in particular. We're going we're to kind of hone in on the second verse, and then we're going to jump to two other verses in Scripture. Well, let's all stand together. Romans chapter 12. And I'm going to read verse 1. When we get down to verse 2, let's read it together in unison. Verse 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Let's read it together. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we ask your blessings upon this time together in your word. I thank you, Lord, for a book that uh, is perfect, a book that is complete, a book that is sure, and that we can go to with absolute, complete confidence in. Lord, because it's your book, and you have not only given it to us by inspiration, but you've also preserved it throughout the ages. And uh, God, we pray that you'd help our hearts to be attuned to it and to your spirit tonight as you speak to our hearts, for it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. You may be seated. What I want you to look with me at is uh, one one particular word, and uh, that's the word uh, conformed. In verse 2, it says, uh, be not conformed. To this world, but be transformed. I want to speak tonight on conformity. And uh, what what does it mean to be conformed to something? Well, it simply means to comply with or to yield to. It means to allow someone to to mold your actions, your attitudes, and your thoughts. It's uh, kind of like a good illustration of this would be a potter. Potter takes a piece of clay and he, he puts it on a wheel. He wets his hands and he starts the wheel spinning. And he's got in mind what he wants that piece of clay to look like. And so he begins to mold that clay. And what the clay begins to do is conform to the pressures that are, are on the hands of the potter trying to make it into whatever form you, you're going to make it into, whether it be a, gla- uh, uh, a, a, a glass or a vase or whatever it might be. But that's what, that's what conformity is. Now, there's three times that the word or a form of the word conformity shows up. Actually, it's the words conformed and conformable. And they're used three times in Scripture. One of them is negative, and it's the one we just read. It just simply tells us, be not conformed to this world. In other words, if you're a Christian, uh, you, should, you should be willing to give your body to God, according to verse 1, by the mercies of God. Uh, we ought to give our body to God and then not be conformed to the world. In other words, we're not, we're not part of that world system anymore because we've been made a new creature in Christ So rather than being conformed to the world, we ought to be transformed. And the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are are passed away. All things are become new. So that's that's the negative side of conformity. Don't be conformed to this world. But whenever I see don't do something, I automatically think, okay, what am I then supposed to do? If I'm not supposed to do one thing, then what am I supposed to do conversely? And uh, there's two more verses that deal with conformity, and we're going to look at them tonight. And they both deal with things that we're supposed to be conformed to. So with that in mind, go with me to Romans chapter 8. Just back up a little bit. Romans chapter 8. And look with me in verses 28 and 29. Romans chapter 8, verses 28 and 29. 
says, and we know that all things work together for good to them who love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that we may be the firstborn among many brethren. Now this says that, that God works on us and works the things that go on in our lives in order to conform us into the image of his son. In other words, we're supposed to, after we get saved, become more and more like Jesus Christ. God says that the thing that he uses to get us to that, to that image, to push us toward Christ's likeness, is all things, all things. And by the way, uh, you know, again, I know what I'm like. Usually when I read that verse, I think of it in the, the negative sense. I think all things. That means all the, all the accidents, all the, the health problems, all the financial difficulties, all the human conflicts. And I look at all the negative stuff and say, okay, God's using all that negative stuff, although I don't like it. Uh, he's using all that stuff to make me more Christ-like. But it doesn't say it's just the negative stuff. It says all things. All things are all things. And so not only the negative things, but also the positive things. And all of those things are used as tools to make us more and more like Jesus Christ. Um, a good question to ask when either, not just when, when a, a difficult or adverse thing comes into your life, but even a good thing, a blessing comes into your life, and just simply ask yourself, okay, why did God let, and then fill in the blank, why did God let that come into my life? There's a reason. And the reason is that he's using all things to conform us to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in the case of the bad things, uh, you know, the difficult things, the the adverse things that happen in our life, those things happen to chip away that which isn't Christ-like. But sometimes he brings things into our lives that, that it is, is missing so that, again, we can be more Christ-like. It could be, you know, he, he doesn't just, just uh, chip away with the, the, the difficulties. He also adds to our lives by the blessings. And the Bible tells us that, you know, daily we're loaded with benefits. Well, what are those benefits for? They're not just so we can bask in the benefits, okay? It's, it's so that we can become more like Jesus Christ. One of, the, one of the definitions that I've heard over the years, and it's a good definition, a uh, good definition of grace Grace is the supernatural resources that God puts into our lives to, to give us the strength and the ability to do God's will. Well, grace is supernatural resources. Is that, is, you know, that could come in any form. Uh, is that part of the all things? Sure it is. Absolutely it is. And, and uh, so God takes everything that is in our life and he's, he's got a goal, and that goal for everything that's in our life is to push us more and more to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, God wants to develop his character and the qualities that he has in us. And all things, you know, uh, includes the difficult times. It also includes the easy times as well as the difficult times. It includes the blessings as, as well as it includes the struggles. All those things are there to push us more and more toward Christ likeness. And it says all things work together for good. Uh, that's the good is making us more and more conformed into the image of Christ. And then it gives a, a qualification. And it says, you know, th this is going to work this way, but here's the attitude you've got to have. This is the, the thing that is absolutely essential for, this, for all of this to work, for this conformity to take place. And that is to them that love God. That's the condition. 
Uh, that's why the Lord says, when asked about which is the great commandment, he said, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy, thy strength and all thy mind. And the second is like unto it, love thy neighbor as thyself. But that first one of loving God is right at the top of the list because that's what God uses when he delivers the all things into our lives uh, to be able to conform us to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it, it says that uh, this is for all those who are the called. That means this is only for saved people. If you, if you don't know for sure that your sins are forgiven, if you're not absolutely positive that if you were to die today that you go to heaven, this isn't for you. Uh, you need to get saved first. Then as soon as you get saved, then God starts working that, that process and he starts, it starts to, to work that process for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And then you go down, get on to the next verse and it says, whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of, of his son. Uh, God says that, that all of these things are used to conform us, to, to press us, to mold us, to make us to be more and more like Jesus Christ. So when praise comes, conform to Christ. Don't get proudful. You know, somebody says something positive about something that you did for the Lord or says something positive about something that you accomplished. Don't, don't allow that thing to go to your head. Use that thing, that all, one of those all things, to get you more and more conformed to Christ. One of the things he wants, he wants us to do is to trust him, depend upon him. And just, you know, one of, the re one of the things we taught our kids, whenever you get a praise, whenever you get a compliment, immediately just respond with, if you don't have anything else to respond with, respond with, well, the Lord is good. In other words, take that, take that praise and deflect it. Don't sit there and absorb it. <laughs> you absorb it and uh, you're going to be in trouble. Uh, the the big-headed pride will start setting in. So instead, you deflect it and you, you turn right around and give that praise to God. When, when blessings come, conform to Christ. Don't get greedy. When the blessings come, uh, you don't get covetous. You conform to Christ. And, and you, you, you make sure that you're, you're thankful uh, for the blessings that he's given to you. What, one of the things I try to do every morning, uh, every morning I thank God for the sleep that I got, even if, it's, even if I tossed and turned, at least I got something, amen? And uh, so I, 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 I thank God for the sleep I got, and I thank God for the food that I'm gonna eat at breakfast time. Um, you, you know, sometimes we, we forget just how dependent we are on God. Can, can I tell you something? Um, and I, I've had many, many things over the years that have shown me that I am in God's hands. I, I'll tell you a good example of that is what we just talked about, about the angles. Uh, I, I saw a picture. Talk to Michael Ann Brosnan afterwards if you want to see a picture of the car and what it looks like. There's no way nobody should have been injured, uh, you know, that, that nobody got injured in, in that car wreck. I mean, it's a wreck. The, the top is, is, is smashed down. The sides are smashed in. Both the airbags went off. I mean, honestly, somebody probably, sh you know, it looks like somebody should have gotten killed. Really, it does. It's, it's just an absolute mess. I looked, at the, I, I looked at that car and I, you know, took my breath away. Uh, you know what that is? That's the blessings of God. That's the blessings of God. Well, when things like that happen, use that and realize that, wait a minute, that happened for a reason. You're, you're still breathing for a reason because God wants to conform you to be more and more like Jesus Christ. When difficulty comes, conform to Christ. Don't, don't, don't get discontented. Don't get you know, don't get bent out of shape. When difficulty comes, don't throw up your hands and quit. Instead, use that difficulty and realize that that difficulty was put into your life for a reason. The reason is conformity. God is working on you. 
and he's working on you to conform you to be more and more like Christ. It, when criticism comes, and you know, and we, all, we're, we all get it, you know, uh, uh, you, don't, you don't have to just be a preacher uh, in order to get criticism. Everybody gets criticism. Uh, sometimes it's justified. Sometimes it's not. And uh, when it's justified, well, okay. Uh, you know, instead of getting bitter and mad and bent out of shape at the person, if, it's a, it, if it is a, a criticism in the form of a rebuke, and, you know, even, even if it's done with the wrong attitude. I, I got a, a letter one time. There's, there was a, a, a young gal out in Green Bay that my wife and I put hours and hours and hours in. I mean, went out and visited her, tried to be a blessing to her, tried to help her. She was in my teen group. And this gal uh, just turned on my wife and I, wrote a letter, I don't know, it was a couple, of, couple three pages long, just laid us out in lavender. I mean, really. Uh, you know, you, you, you'd, have, you'd have thought we were the Antichrist by the time you got done reading, <laughs> reading the letter. It was just a mess. And uh, at first, I wanted to just, I was just getting upset. And then I realized, what if any of it's true? If any of it's true, I'm responsible for it, even if it was given with a wrong attitude. And so I stopped, you know, I went through the letter one time, and, and I'll be real honest, I went through the, the letter the first time with a really rotten attitude, okay? I had, I, it, and it got worse as we got toward the end of the letter. Uh, I went through it again and said, okay, God, speak to my heart. If there's something I have done to justify even a little bit of this, show it to me, and I'll get it right. And then I gave it to my wife, and she read it. And I, we talked about that. And I said, do you, you know, do you, do you see anything you've done? Have you, did you, have you seen anything that I have done? I haven't seen anything that you have done. I think we've, we've gone and tried to do our best to try to be a, a blessing to this gal. But no matter what it is that comes your way, if, it, if it's in that all thing, things category, which means everything that happens in your life, everything that happens this week is going to happen on purpose, and the purpose is to conform you into the image of his dear son. And God, God has, a, has a, a mission this week to get you to become more and more like Jesus Christ. So that's the, that's the first positive conformity. Let's look at the second one. Go to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians 3, verse 10. Philippians 3, 10. Paul is, is uh, writing to the Philippians. It's a, it's a, very, it's a very joyous letter. Uh, in fact, the, the, uh, the Philippians, the Philippian church was a real blessing to the apostle Paul. And uh, he just, he just uh, they, they, they came and took care of some of his needs at a time when everyone else uh, had shut off the supply. And uh, he was just thankful for these people. And he says this in verse 10 of, uh, of chapter 3. He says, that I may know him, and that's speaking of the Lord, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. The second thing that we're to conform to is not only to his image, but we're to be conformed unto his death. Well, what in the world does that mean? What does it mean to be conformed to the death of Jesus Christ? Well, his death involved a couple of things. Go with me to Matthew chapter 20. And this will give us a clue as to what we're to be conformed to. Matthew chapter 20, verses uh, 20 through 23. Verse 20 says, Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant 
that these my two sons may sit, the one on the right hand and the other on the left hand, in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, We are able. And he saith unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. According to that, that passage, uh, Christ's death involved a cup and a baptism. Uh, his, his death involved the attitude of not my will but thine be done. That's an attitude of surrender and submission. When he was in the garden, he said, Lord, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And it was, he was addressing some particular agony that he was about to be inflicted with. And, uh, and he asked, if it's possible. Now, he wasn't asking to get out of the cross because that's the whole reason why he came. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to be the sacrifice for our sins. But that grief, that suffering that was going to be poured out upon him, he says, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. There was a, there was a surrender. There was a submissive spirit there. Uh, his, his death involved a willingness to, to be wounded both uh, by others and for others. When Jesus Christ went to the cross, uh, he, did, he did not have to be pushed onto the cross. He laid down his life, the Bible tells us. That means that it was voluntary. That means there was no struggle when they put the nail in his hand. He held it there and let them do it without trying to pull away at all. Uh, there was no struggle when they nailed his feet to the cross. Uh, he, was, he was willing to do that. His, his death involved a willingness to be wounded. Christ, Christ died and gave his life for the very people who put him on the cross. I mean, you know, you go, you go to John 3, 16, it says, God so loved the world. Who is that? That's everybody. That's, there, there's, that's no, no exclusions there. So that means that the very people that commandeered his death, he was willing to pay the price for their sin. And he did. He did pay that price. Uh, you know, when, when you reach out to help someone, uh, to be a blessing to someone who's hurting, uh, don't be surprised if when you bring your hand back, you're missing a few fingers. <laughs> that's, I'm just saying, that's what happens, okay? Uh, yeah, I was talking with someone here just recently. We were talking about a, a particular uh, situation and a particular couple of people. And I said, you know, I probably put more time into those folks than, uh, than, than, than some of our best folks here in our church over, over the years. This is over the whole 33 years. And, uh, and, and yet, when they walked out the door, they didn't even say goodbye. They didn't say, there was no thank you, there was no nothing. Oh, okay, uh, so what? So what? That's part of it. And, and what, what the Lord's saying here is, is you need to be conformed unto his death. He was willing to die for those who plucked out his beard. He died for those who blindfolded him, came along and slapped him and said, who is it that smote you? Well, that's, a, that's a terrible thing to do. And Honestly, you know, on the, on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. If that, that soldier or that individual that, just, that slapped the Lord when he was blindfolded, if he really understood who he just hit, he never would have done that. He never would have done that. I mean, 
All Christ would have had to do is speak the word, and he could have been a, a French fry right there. <laughs> I mean, just you could have just fried him right where he stood. He, 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 wouldn't have, he wouldn't have had to be dramatic. He wouldn't have had to point his finger. He'd just say the word, and boom, that guy would have been like a fly in a microwave, you know. Uh, he, he'd have been gone. It, they didn't realize what they were doing. They had no idea that they were crucifying the creator. And um, his death involved a willingness to suffer unjustly. And God says, listen, I want you to be conformed to his death. I, I want you to have the same attitude that Jesus Christ had when he died on the cross. Uh, his death involved a willingness to suffer unjustly. His death involved a willingness to suffer shame. You know, are you willing to go through shame for him? I really believe in our country we have turned a corner. Uh, we have turned a corner like I've never seen before. And I'm, I'm not saying that to be dramatic. It's just a fact. Uh, Christianity is no longer the friend of America. Christianity is the enemy. Christianity is the problem. We talked about this in, in Sunday school this morning when uh, Elijah came up to Eli uh, came up to Ahab. King Ahab was a wicked, wicked, evil king. He, he, Ahab addressed Elijah as he that troubleth Israel. The truth of the matter is, it wasn't, a, it wasn't Elijah that was troubling Israel. It was Ahab himself who said that, that was actually the problem. Uh, he had led Israel in the wrong direction, and he and his wife together, he and Jezebel. And uh, it was just a real mess, but, but he didn't see it. Well, that's what's happening in America. Are you ready to suffer shame? Are you ready to, to take the brunt, possibly, and if the Lord tarries is coming, I think that's, that's what's coming down the pipe. Do you have a willingness? Understand, uh, Christ did not fight this when he went to the cross. And I, I believe that's, that's exactly what, what the Lord is talking about over, over in Philippians chapter 3. Go back with me to Philippians 3, if you would. Philippians chapter 3, and, and his death, his death included a desire. And the desire, and you see this desire when, when Christ uh, prayed his high priestly prayer in uh, John 17, when you see Christ in the garden and he says, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless not my will but thine be done. Uh, his death in, involved a, a desire to please the Father at any cost. He, you know, he didn't put any stipulations on it. At any cost, he was willing to suffer for the Father. He wanted to please the Father. And it tells us over in Isaiah, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Because he knew that was part of the plan. He knew that was necessary. Are you willing to do whatever is necessary? And notice if, if, as we go back to Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10, notice the progression. He says this, that I may know him, speaking of, of the Lord, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings uh, being made conformable unto his death. He says that, first of all, you got to get to know him. Then as you know him, you see the power of his resurrection. And as you see his power in your life, uh, you, you will end up uh, suffering for him, and as you suffer, there will be fellowship uh, with God. Th these three things are the three things that God uses to conform us uh, to, in, into the, the attitude that Jesus Christ had at his death. So the first thing that he says is we need to know him. Uh, we need to know, know who God is. We need to know how he thinks, what his character is, what his heart is. Uh, the more you love him, the better you'll know him. And, and the, really the key to that whole thing is just loving God. Keep your finger here in Philippians and go with me to John 
Uh, chapter 14. Go to John 14. In John 14, look down in verse 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. And I will love him and will manifest myself to him. What that, what that simply means is this. There's a progression there as well. You love God. If you really love God, you'll keep his commandments. And as you love God and therefore keep his commandments... God manifests himself to you. That means he reveals himself. You learn some things about God that you wouldn't have learned otherwise. Uh, over in the book of Psalms, it says, A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. As we love him, as we obey him, then he reveals himself to us, and we get to, to, to really know who he is. And you... you you know, the bottom line is you, be, you, you become like and get to know someone that you spend a lot of time with. And the more you obey God, the more you love God and obey God, the more he'll reveal himself to, it, to you. Then secondly, the power of his resurrection. Again, keep your finger here. Go with me to Romans chapter 6. Romans 6. And in Romans 6, look at me beginning in verse 4. It says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism unto death. That's talking about the, the uh, being placed into Christ at salvation. It's not talking about water baptism. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield your, yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. In other words, what God gives us as, as we obey him, as we yield ourselves to the spirit of God rather than our own desires and our own lusts, then, then he gives us the power to walk in that newness of life. And what that power does is God does for us what we can't do for ourselves. Uh, there's, a, there, there's a limit to what you, can, what you can do for God because of your, or your, your physical limitations, your mental and spiritual limitations. And God gives you the grace and gives you the strength and gives you that supernatural power to get those things accomplished. That's the power of his resurrection. And then the third thing is the fellowship of his sufferings. Now, that sounds like a contradic uh, contradiction. Uh, you know, you, you say, well, I'm suffering, but you're saying that there's some fellowship. Yeah, as you suffer for, for, for God and as God takes you through some things, uh, God teaches us some things, and there's some things that are accomplished uh, when we suffer, and we respond to that suffering in the right way there's some things that are, that are accomplished that can't be accomplished any other way. Through suffering, we get pushed back to the scriptures. We learn some things in scripture. We, uh, we uh, learn about some promises. We start getting desperate a little bit when you, when you suffer. Uh, that's all good. 
because what that does is that pushes you back to God and it causes you to become more dependent upon him. It, it, uh, when, you, when you suffer, it gives you some insight. Uh, I was talking to some folks here recently and uh, I have been where they currently are uh, going through some trouble. And uh, you know what? I'm not hard on folks when they're going through trouble, particularly if, I, if it's anything even similar to any kind of trouble that I've been through. Why? Well, because I, I know what that path is. You know, I know what that path is. And, and uh, God will allow you to go through that suffering to teach you some things, give you some insight you wouldn't have had otherwise. The other thing that it does, if you respond right, and you've got to respond right, but if you respond right to the suffering and to the trouble and the difficulty, it tenderizes your heart. It'll give you some compassion uh, that you wouldn't have otherwise. Another thing it'll do, and it kind of goes hand in hand with that, it knocks out a critical spirit. I, I, I remember when I was in Wisconsin, in fact, for the whole time I was up there, I watched preachers come and I watched preachers go. I watched preachers go into a church, stay there for two, three, four, five years, and then leave. And watch another one come and then leave. And man, was I in my spirit. And I don't know that I, I said a lot to preacher, but preacher Keck, but I don't know that I, I said a lot you know, to a lot of other people. But I had a real critical spirit about that, that whole thing. And uh, I had, you know, no compassion, no mercy, no grace, none of that for it. Man, if you go someplace, you ought to stick. And that's all there is to it. And then God called me out of Green Bay, put me in a place over in western New York, and three and a half years later, I'm leaving and coming to Auburn, New York to pastor here. Uh, guess what? I don't criticize those folks so much anymore. <laughs> Uh, that knocks out the critical spirit. It, it just does. When you go through some difficulties yourself, and you, know, you know what it does? It puts you kind of in the shoes of the person that you're watching going through the difficulty. And uh, when, when you stood in those shoes, you have a different perspective. And it, all the way around, the biggest probably benefit of, of, of that kind of suffering, the fellowship of his sufferings, is it teaches us to trust God when you don't know what you're doing. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've talked with folks that they're going through a difficulty, but it's a difficulty like they've never been through before. You ever been there? You know, a difficulty like you've never been through before. And, 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 you know, you, I don't know about you, but I don't like walking around in the dark. I don't like going places where I don't know what I, where I'm going. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't like that. But you know what? When you're, when you're in the dark, understand God's never in the dark. <laughs> I mean, he's never, he's never, he's, he's never clueless. He's never, uh, he's never rudderless. He knows exactly what's going on. He knows exactly what the situations are. And you know what you, you learn to do? You learn, well, I guess I guess just got to trust God. I've never been here before. And you do. Now, do you ever make mistakes when you're in those? Oh, yeah, all the time. But you know what I found? I found over and over and over again, God's very, very merciful uh, in those kind of situations. And you learn something about your God. There is fellowship with the Lord, uh, and it's sweet. Some of the sweetest times I've had with God has been during some of the roughest times of my entire life. I remember back many, 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 many moons ago when Jonathan was born. Uh, he was born seven weeks early. My wife was in the hospital. Jonathan was in the hospital. The kid... Uh, I say the kids, it was only Joel, because it was Joel and then John. Uh, Joel was farmed out to somebody else, so I came home to an empty house. I can remember, I can remember it, to, it as, as if it were yesterday, going down the basement stairs on Ori Lane in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and just screaming out to God. Man, I was hurting. I was hurting. Can I tell you something? That was one of the sweetest times I'd ever spent with God that night. 
And uh, afterwards, God answered a huge prayer. Huge prayer. He said, did he? Oh, yeah. And he's sitting right there in about the fourth or fifth row. Uh, God spared Jonathan's life. And, uh, you know, there are a few times I've asked, well, what in the world did I pray that for? But, <laughs> but, but you know what? I, that, was a, that, was a, that was a tough time, but at the same time, it was a real sweet time. It was a sweet time. And that's the fellowship of his sufferings. So in conclusion, let me, let me ask you some, throw some questions your way, get you thinking. Number one, is there any area of your life that you've not submitted to God? Is there any area of your life that you've not submitted to God? Because God uses our submission to conform us and to make us more like himself. Do you desire to please God more than anyone else, and especially yourself? Thirdly, are you fully confident that God controls all that happens to you? You know, all things work together for good. We can read that. We can recite it. We can memorize it. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? All things work together for good. Are, are you fully confident that he controls those all things? And, and do, do you trust him when he throws something at you and you say, what in the world is this all about? Well, there's a lesson to be learned. There's an attitude that he wants to get out of us. There's some conformity to his death and there's some conformity to his image that he's working on. And then lastly, are your, are, are your attitudes and your actions and your appearance like the world? That was where we started the, this evening in uh, chapter 12 and verse 2 of the book of Romans. Are they like the world or are they like Christ? Are, are, are you not conformed to this world, but are you conformed to the image of his son and, and unto his death. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we pray that as we think on this issue of conformity. You know, I, I remember being raised in the 60s when nonconformity was the thing. And uh, yeah, we shouldn't conform to people. We shouldn't conform to the world. We shouldn't conform to our own desires, but we certainly should be conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we ought to be conformed unto his death. We ought to have the same kind of attitude that the Lord Jesus Christ had when he went to the cross. Help us, God, to take a look at our own lives and, and the all things that you brought into our lives to cause both of these things to be a reality. God, please, work in this invitation. Speak to our hearts. And Lord, as, as you point out things to us, may we not just push them off to the side, but may we confront them. And uh, Lord, may we be part of the conformity that pleases you. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's all stand together. Let's stand with heads bowed and eyes closed. The invitation's open. Altar's open. God's speaking to your heart that there's something that God's brought to your attention that uh, needs some conformity. Again, the negative conformity is be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The positive conformity is to his image to, unto his death.
prayer. Dan Corey, come on up if you would, and uh, dismiss us in order of prayer. Dear the Father, I thank you uh, that we could be here tonight. I'm thankful for your word, and I pray that you'd help us to take this uh, reminder and that we would make sure that um, throughout this week that we would uh, line up according to your word and that we would, even though it's uh, difficult at times, uh, to um, take a stand, and it's not real popular, but I pray that we would um, help us not to just go along with uh, those around us, that we would be different and that you would help us to uh, spend time with you so that we can be different. And I uh, pray that you as we go tonight, uh, that you'd give us safety, continue to watch over um, the angles so that you would uh, heal, heal them up. And uh, also I just ask that you'd just continue to be with the Delano family and be close to them and and uh, give them strength and um, bring us back uh, together again on Wednesday and uh, help us uh, throughout this week, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay.